Welcome to the Ummah Talk podcast with me, Fatima Barakatullah. In this podcast episode, I spoke to Yoram Van Kavaran, uh, who, who was a, uh, a, a politician in the Netherlands. And it was a really interesting conversation. It was, wow, it really got me thinking um, about so many things. And I, I just wanted to bounce certain ideas off him as well, you know. Um, I know that some people, they like listening to podcasts where you're just like allowing the, the guest to speak. Um, and I, I hope I did that. Uh, but my podcast is about a discussion. You know, it's not just a one-way conversation. It's It's two-way. And it is about me sharing my ideas and bouncing them off my guests, um, especially esteemed guests such as Yoram. Um, so yeah, enjoy the podcast. Uh, let me know what you thought of it. Like leave a comment, let me know like um, what, which ideas stood out for you or if there's something you agree with or disagree with, perhaps there's a point of view that I haven't considered or taken on board. I'm always open to changing uh, my mind about things. Uh, so yeah, share away. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to Ummah Talk. Today I have with me somebody I've been intrigued to talk with. And I know that a lot of you will also be really interested to uh, to hear from I have with me Yoram van Clavern, also known as the Crown Prince of Wilders. He, he was a famous critic of Islam. As a former member of the Dutch Parliament and a representative of the Party for Freedom, he, in his past, he submitted numerous bills related to Islam, such as those calling for the closing of mosques, for removing the Quran from Parliament and for banning Islam from the Netherlands. But today he is a Muslim, alhamdulillah, and I have his book with me. Um, it's called Apostate, and it's all about his his journey to Islam. So, assalamu alaikum, brother Yoram. Alaikum salam. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me on the show. It's a great honor. Alhamdulillah. It's, no, it's, it's, it's a real honor to speak to you. Um, and I see that you've um, been collaborating or at least speaking with uh, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Professor Abdul Hakim Murad. So that's that's nice. Uh, how, how did you get to know them? Uh, well, um, of course, uh, I was uh, writing a book, <laughs> an, yeah. an, an anti-Islamic book. At least that was what I wanted to do when I started writing. Um but during during the writing, I came across so much information that was at odds with the things I thought I knew. That uh, in the end, because I wanted to be a, a book of truth with a capital T, uh, that I had to make sure that certain things that I was writing down were correct. So, um, and in the Netherlands, uh, I wrote to various uh, academic. Uh, uh, scholars uh, when it came to uh, to Islam, but uh, the answers weren't always satisfying. So I started writing to other authorities on this uh, subject. And one of the uh, persons I wrote to was Abdul Hakim Murad, a sheikh from uh, um, Cambridge University. Uh, so that's, that's how it started. And I was uh, writing him um, while knowing, of course, that it was the, the chances were pretty uh, small that he was writing back because, of course, I was a member of an anti-Islamic political party in another country writing an anti-Islamic yeah. So there was not a real reason for him to answer me. And I, to be honest, I put a little uh, link of my Wikipedia page in English in the mail so he would know who I was so that he wouldn't have the feeling that I was tricking him or something. Uh, yeah. And it, it took a lot of uh, days, I think six weeks or something and uh, all of a sudden he wrote back and it was a very extensive uh, mail with uh, yeah answer he, he answered uh, numerous questions i asked he pointed to books articles uh, other persons i could uh, ask uh, about islam and uh, certain specific topics when it came to uh, certain re uh, related topics when it came to uh, yeah, islam for example uh, um, 
law or uh, Akita or stuff like that. And he says, well, if you want to know more about this certain point, you ask this person or write this person or read this book or that article. So that's how I came in contact with uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. Uh, and after my book um, um, uh, almost finished, I um, was invited by um, uh, Hamza uh, Yusuf in uh, California. Mm -hmm. uh, so he asked me, are you willing to do a video with me? Uh, talking about your journey, and uh, that's what I did. So I came in contact with him, and it was even before uh, the English uh, translation. So when I said it will be translated into English, uh, I asked them both, uh, do you want to write something in the book? Because I had a lot of contacts with you guys, uh, especially Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad uh, in the beginning. Uh, yeah. And they, yeah, they were very, of course, for me, it was a great honor that they uh, uh, were thinking about doing it. And when they really did write something as a foreword, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great honor, of course. And uh, I hope it uh, benefits uh, the book. I think that's great. So, so for people who don't know, you were writing a book to refute Islam, to criticize Islam, right, initially. And so you were researching for this book. And so it seems like you were really doing an, a, a very sincere type of research because not many people who have anti-Islam sentiments would go to the trouble to actually contact, you know, like orthodox or traditional Muslims, you know. Um, they probably just rely on second secondary sources or, you know, their own western academics who maybe are anti-islam whatever so it seems like you like what made you take it so seriously that you would actually contact somebody who had so abdul hakim murad of course he's a convert himself right um was that part of the reason why you contacted him no, because I, I didn't know. I just saw his name and I thought, oh, well, oh. He's, he's a great scholar. I didn't know him. So I didn't know he was a convert. I didn't know who he was, what his background. But the only thing I knew was the information I got from a, uh, yeah, from a small uh, paper in the Netherlands. It said that it, it uh, gave some names of scholars in, uh, in the UK, in the US, in Singapore, Malaysia, Egypt and uh, other countries. And one of the persons was Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. And, and I, I was reading what he did. Oh, wow came up to his study, mm -hmm. and then I said, well, th this must be someone who knows a lot. <laughs> so I, write, I wrote him. So it wasn't that I thought, well, he's a comfort or, or whatever. I, I didn't know that. Wow, okay. So, no, but uh, when, I, when I was uh, writing my book, um, it, it has a little bit to do with my background. I was uh, brought up in, um, in, a, uh, in a church, and that was a pretty traditional denomination. Mm. Um, and, Which uh, denomination was that? Yeah, the Reformed Church of the Netherlands. Okay. It's a specific. Uh, well, of course, in you have, uh, when you look at Christianity, there are three uh, big uh, denominations. Of course, the, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the, the Roman mm -hmm. Catholic Church, and the Protestant Church. And within the Protestant Church, there are almost a thousand <laughs> denominations. And one okay. of the denominations I was in in the Netherlands because some are specific Dutch. That was the Reformed Church of the Netherlands. Um, but it was a pretty, when you look at, look at the, the, the theology and uh, the whole culture, um, it, it was pretty traditional. And it wasn't that I was brought up in a very strict way, but mm. the theology was. So we prayed, uh, when, especially when I was young, we prayed uh, before dinner, after dinner. We went to church. Everybody had biblical names. We were all baptized. We went to Sunday school, stuff like that. So... It was real practicing Christian, especially in the in the mm. family setting. Uh, but uh, when when I reached the age of uh, around 15, 16, 17, uh, of course, you start having your questions uh, when it, came, it comes to religion. Like all youngsters have, whether you are Christian or Muslim or Hindu or whatever, uh, you start questioning the things uh, that, that you uh, were taught. Uh, is this the truth? Uh, why do we believe this? Uh, who wrote those uh, books and stuff like that. So, uh, and then I, for the first time, I got a little, uh, I got my doubts when it came, for example, to the concept of God in Christianity, because in Christianity, you have the, the Trinity, God the Father, uh, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that was the first time that I thought, well, it sounds kind of complex, a little bit illogical. Mm -hmm. 
to me then. Uh, so I start questioning. So that's uh, that's as a teenager, right? Yeah, as a teenager, right? So uh, and I was very, I was kind of a nerdy guy. <laughs> uh, so okay. I I, uh, I was I loved reading. Uh, yeah. So. I, I read a lot of books, especially books from the scholars of my own tradition, like uh, Martin Luther, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the guy who started the Reformation and, and the Protestant Church, uh, but also Calvin and people like that. And they were very anti-Islam. When you read those books, of course, it had to do with the context back then. Uh, there was yeah. the tension between Europe and the Ottoman Empire, of course. Uh, but uh, th those people were very uh, hostile when it came to Islam in a theological sense, but also in a cultural sense. Because they said, well, it's the enemy and they are a threat to Christian Europe back then. So uh, that, that's what I was reading. And so, of course, that forms you. And uh, when you ask mm. the ministers or people in, your, uh, in the church or in, in um, the denomination you are brought up in, uh, and people confirm that, yeah, then, of course, that becomes part of the things you think that is true and, and that are true. So that's, that's what happened when it came to Islam. And, but when, it, when I was uh, uh, to forward to the book, when I was writing my book, the questions I was uh, doubting as a, as a youngster, like, for example, the Trinity, but also uh, the atonement that uh, Jesus Christ had to die as a sacrifice for mankind and uh, his death and resurrection are essential. Otherwise, God couldn't forgive mankind. And that's a central dogma in Christianity, uh, especially mm -hmm. that he dies, of course, because he was sacrificed for the sins of mankind. Uh, and I always thought it was kind of strange because in the Bible itself, especially in the Old Testament, it says that the fathers are not responsible for the sins of their sons and the other way around. So everybody yeah. is in, when you're an adult, of course, when you're an adult, you're responsible for your own deeds. You cannot say, well, my grandfather did that, so now I'm saved, or the other way around. Um, yeah. You cannot blame people for the things uh, their father did or their grandfather or whatever, uh, just like you cannot blame their children for you being a bad person. But when I was reading that, I thought that that's a kind of strange because we see this concept, uh, it's essential to Christianity, because you say... Well, original sin, yeah. Because mm. Adam sinned, and because his sin, everybody will go to hell, when you look at the denomination I was brought up in. Yeah. Uh, and they said, well, there's only one way to salvation, and that is believing in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But when I was young, I also asked people uh, about, for example, Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses, and I said, well, are those people in hell? And the minister said, no, of course, not a strange question. I said, no, that's not a strange question because you said the only way to salvation is believing in the crucifixion and uh, yeah, resurrection Jesus. of Jesus Christ. But they couldn't believe in him because he wasn't born yet. So if that's the only way to salvation, they must be in hell. And I said, no, of course not. And then I thought to myself, well, there are probably two ways then, <laughs> the old way. And yeah, the way. more than one way. Yeah, yeah. and, and so the, these type of questions, uh, and it, had, it all had to do with the dogmas of Christianity, um, were, were something I was struggling with as a youngster. So when I, was, when I was writing my book, those questions popped up again because uh -huh. I... Site, uh, and I thought, well, perhaps I don't get it. I'm not smart enough, or it's too, it's a mystery, or whatever. Uh, I parked it and I just uh, lived my life. But when I was writing my anti Islam book, I compared Christianity to, to Islam because a lot of people th uh, think that a book is a very political book, but it isn't. It's a very theological book because it wasn't so much that I was writing uh, out of the context that I was a member of an extreme anti Islamic political party but it was i was a christian and that's why that's why i was anti-islam for myself of course that right and because uh, i was uh, comparing christianity with islam the questions about for example the concept of god popped up again and then i saw this concept and of course i studied comparative religion so i knew about tawhid for example but mm. there was a descriptive way because you learn it as an object of study and not so much as an alternative for the truth, the truth mm. that I was with. So when I was uh, writing uh, about God, for example, and I compared Tawhid with the Trinity, I thought, well, I have much more in common in a logical sense. And also when I look at the Old Testament with Tawhid concept and with the Trinity. So that's how it started. So it wasn't that I um, 
felt like I didn't want to use Western sources because that was the, the question. Yeah. Uh, it was because I saw that a lot of things that were written down by Westerners all, of course, are written from a Christian perspective, especially the old books. So I had, to, I thought to myself, if I want to really want to know what they are believing and how they are believing and why, I have to ask them. Them, the yes, exactly. So and that's how I ended up with uh, the Muslim scholars. Okay, right. Yeah, but you know, you be you, you probably know that a lot of people don't take the trouble to do that because they they'll um, you know uh, rely on maybe just the people they know. So it's it's great that you took that extra effort, you know, and I think that really speaks to your sincerity, really, you know, mashallah. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, I'm a lady who, you know, I usually wear the face veil uh, when I go out. Uh, not always, but, um, you know, I do. If if in your past life, in, when you were with, in uh, the party, uh, if you'd come across somebody like me on the street or, I don't know, I don't know where we would meet, um, at university or something like that, what what would your reaction have been internally, like, and even externally? Um, yeah. I think that has to do with because that differs, of course. It's not that all people in the in the anti-Islamic political parties all over Europe or the world have the same uh, state of mind, of course. Yeah. But because I was a Christian, I was familiar with the with, for example, the hijab, and not like a hijab in an Islamic way. But when you look at nuns, for example, in uh, the Catholic Church, they uh, are failed too, of course. And in the tradition I was brought up in. Uh, when you look at the denomination and the, the specific um, things you have to do as a religious person, when you look at a man and women, then you see that women, for example, have to wear hats or scarf when they enter church. Church, yes. Yeah. So it's not in all churches, especially not in the modern evangelical churches, but in the old churches, that is something that uh, has to be done by the women. So it wasn't that I thought, well, she's failed, she's scary. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah. it, it was, and that was because of, I think, the, the Christian background that you knew that it had to do with the concept of God. But in, and that's perhaps that's something new uh, for a lot of people, in my old party, and I know that is, uh, for example, in other anti-Islamic parties in Europe, it's the same concept that lives there. That is that they say, well, um, Islam is like a colonization force mm. they come into Europe and it's that they um, they they objectify it in a military sense. So what they say is the, the girls who are failed or uh, face or yeah. whatever, they are wearing a uniform. So they say they are soldiers for Islam. Right. So, uh, for men, for, uh, it's, for example, it's the beard <laughs> or okay, yeah. clothing, but the girls always have to uh, fill themselves, of course. And when you're using what, what uh, it doesn't matter what kind of uh, form, but they say it's it's like a uniform. So they say, well, the mosques are, for so to say, they're, uh, their military bases, uh, the people are the militaries, and the, the way they are dressing are uh, uniform. So they, and of course, that's very uh, twisted in a, in a uh, very ridiculous way of seeing it, but that's how they viewed it. And of course, it has to do with the ideology that Islam is the enemy. So what they right. do is they say, well, they're you're wearing a uniform. So in a political sense, I would say uh, she's, she's an enemy because of what she was yeah. wearing. So in other words, it's like a symbol, right? It's a symbol of the Muslim takeover, right? Yeah, true. Of Europe. So, yeah. so see, because that's interesting. Because when I, I'm I'm of Indian origin, right? Uh, my parents were uh, migrated to Britain, right, in the seventies. Um, actually, I think we're born in the same in the same year, seventy nine. Yeah. So I was born in. Sorry. It was a good, a good year. year. Yeah, it's a good year. Uh, I was uh, born here in London in 79. And I must say, growing up, my mom was like the only woman wearing hijab, you know, like it wasn't normal at all. It was like rare, very rare. In fact, she would get, she didn't understand English, <laughs> but she would get sworn at, you know, like if we were walking uh, together, uh, some racist people would just say something, you know, whenever they saw her because she looked so different 
but slowly but surely by the time and even myself at school I was the only girl wearing hijab growing up in the 90s 80s 90s um but now I get it you know like the landscape of Europe has changed like even UK it's like the hijab is normal it's like literally normal uh so within I guess two decades or something um suddenly the hijab became so much more visible because this new generation of uh, Muslims actually rediscovered their faith, right? They rediscovered Islam. Sometimes their parents were not even religious or their parents didn't encourage religion at all. But I mm -hmm. guess when you're in a, growing up in a country where you face racism um, casually sometimes and you, you're just, you're a minority, right? You, you ask yourself, like, actually, who am I? You know, am I British? Am I, what is it to be British? What is it, what, what do I actually believe? And so I think yep. in, a, in a strange sort of way, even our generation had to rediscover our faith, you know? So you've been on a journey, right? Uh, yeah. But we've all been on a journey too. Yeah. And so that manifestation that you see of hijabis, you know, people adopting hijab, uh, each generation probably more and more, is actually got nothing to do with, you know, military things or even political it's things. It's literally, it's literally people rediscovering their, their faith yeah. and choosing to adopt it. Sometimes it's also because growing up, like, when I used to observe um, some of the problems in society and some of the things that troubled me, like the objectification of women, you know, on television, like in the eighties, television was terrible. Like, you know, there was women were literally used as objects, you know, like in every movie, every film. And so something inside me would always dislike that and feel that that was very cheap and, do you know what I mean? So, so I think sometimes even the fact that we saw the opposite of Islam, um, the opposite way of life in a way enacted in front of us and the problems of that made us feel stronger when it came to, when we, when we read about Islam, what Islam says, we thought, yeah, this makes sense because I can see the problems caused when this isn't there. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And But I also think that it has to do with uh, the fact that a lot of people are scared of uh, um, the, the triumphs of Islam, so to say, yeah? because you, you said yeah. it was a symbol. And when, uh, when you looked at the political ideology and the theory that we wrote for yes. the Netherlands, when it came, we always said we have to take down the triumphs of Islam. That's why we said we want a ban of minarets. That's why we want a ban Ooh. of that's why we said we don't want to have a Quran. So it's like things things that show that Islam is prominent, it's, that Islam is yeah. growing, right? And they say, well, we have to take it down. We have to marginalize it. We have to show them it's nothing. It's something you can walk over like 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 a, like a carpet, for so to say. Um, so, so, so what are those things? Minarets, hijabs, minarets, what else? Mosques, uh, mosques, mosques. Uh, uh, halal food. Um, halal food. Books, um uh, the Quran itself. What did you say after halal food? Sorry. Uh, books. Um, books. Books, yeah, certain books that they say, well, uh, for example, the Quran, they say, well, yeah. it's a very prominent book, of course. It's the holy book. It's it's the central yeah. of Islam. So they say, when you when you can ban that from the Netherlands, you say, it's nothing for us. We, we it's, and, and it's, uh, it's very harsh to say, but uh, back then, and it has been done numerous times, but they also compare the Quran with Mein Kampf, for example. And Mein Kampf was the book that was written by Adolf Hitler. Hitler, to, yeah. But they say, well, it's the same. It's a license to kill. That's something literally that we said. Quran is a license to kill. Look at all the terrorists. So we have to take it down. It's a triumph for them, and we don't want it here. So, so, so I'm just trying to understand the trajectory of somebody like you. So when you're, you're a Christian, you're... You've been introduced to some anti-Islamic rhetoric from uh, Christian sources already, right? That's kind of understandable, right? Because of the history. Yeah. But then what what took you from that to this party? Like, And were you fully 
down with what they were saying or did you just join them because it was cool i don't know the thing to do or the the most aligned to what you were do you know yeah. what i mean no i was really down i was sometimes more down than builders himself i i think okay uh, so i was really really anti-islam but i had to do like i said with um uh, with, with the books with the, the denomination i was brought up in but also the first day i went to college was 9 11. so oh, the wow. first day i was introduced to uh university with introduction uh weekend and the first day we started really have having um uh, uh colleges uh, it was 9 11. so in the morning we went with the train to the university and then i said well there's uh, something happened something really bad and then everybody wow. started in television and it was 9 11 so i thought to myself oh yeah that was right those crazy people the muslims and then of course they attacked the world trade center three thousand people dead etc etc but after that i i started um with my with my uh, study of course and it was at the free university in amsterdam so it wasn't that I, there were no muslims for example i knew yeah. a lot of Muslims back then also but um when i talked to them we never really discussed religion in a in a uh, in a in a real uh, way, yeah. not in a deep way. We never discussed. Deep, yeah. it. No, it was just like, okay, you are a Muslim. Okay, I don't like Islam, but I'm a Christian, and perhaps you don't like Christianity. That was it. And then, of course, so there was no like Dawa Dawa no, schools or anything. No, absolutely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Uh, but after that, in and I was still in college because I studied from 2001 till 2005. Uh, okay. Before I got my doctorate and. Um, uh, in 2004, there was this famous filmmaker in the Netherlands. Perhaps you ever heard of him. His name was Theo van Gogh. And Theo van Gogh, he was uh, shut down and his uh, throat was slit in the middle of the streets of Amsterdam by a guy who called himself a jihadi. And then he pointed... Oh, we, we call him Theo van Gogh here. Okay, yeah, okay, no. Yes. Uh, and, uh, well, he was murdered in the streets. Yeah. And, uh, they put a knife oh, in yes, I remember. And yep. on the knife, there was a letter as well. And a lot of people don't know that, but there was a letter for Ayan Hirshi Ali. Yes. And it yes. said, well, you will be next. Um, so when I saw that, after I already was kind of anti-Islam, then 9-11 happened. And then two blocks away from my old house, this guy was killed in the middle of the street, uh, slitting his throat, shooting him with a knife in his stomach. I thought, okay, well, I have to do something to protect the country against this evil, this this sick ideology of Islam. So what can I do? What person mm -hmm. is most anti-Islam in politics? Because I thought to myself, I have to do something in politics. Then I can change the law. Otherwise, I cannot make a difference. So in, uh, in 2004, before Theo van Gogh was killed, Geert Wilders split away from his old party. He was in the same party as our current prime minister, the Liberal Party. And he mm -hmm. was the right side of the right wing, so to say, the conservative mm -hmm. wing of that uh, political party and he split away because he, there were talks with turkey uh the country um because uh, they said well perhaps you can be a member of the european union and the liberal party said well we do we have to say this is an option but for Geert Wilders, of course he said well this is crazy we, we cannot have an, an islamic country becoming a member of the european union especially not right. because it's not in europe and it is our historical enemy well etc etc uh, so he yeah, said and that. and it would it would only increase that feeling of you know the freedom of movement thing would mean yeah. that uh, Europeans oh, were like, <laughs> we're going to be swamped yeah. by the Turks right that's that's exactly the rhetoric here as well in yeah. the UK well, you know yeah well that's mm. and it, and it's the same in the Netherlands in Austria in Switzerland in France and, and it's like you say in the UK as well though, though the Brits are a bit more polite about it like <laughs> the, the Brits would never say that blatantly but okay. well, you know, well, they there's like this undertone. <laughs> Yeah, I know they're very, yeah, perhaps you're a little bit more polite, but, but, but they yeah. say here very, um, yeah, in your face. So wow. it's not yeah. that uh, people are trying to hide something. Um, mm. Of course, I, I, I saw him and I saw, well, he must be the guy who will fix it, fix the problem. So I joined his party and then I became, um, yeah, I became a member of, uh, of the, the Freedom Party. At first, I was um, a policymaker. Uh, behind the scenes, so to say, uh, mm -hmm. but then, uh, after after a few years, there were, were elections, and uh, Wilders asked me, "Don't you want to be a member of parliament? Because you study comparative religion, so you can say something about Islam, and they cannot say you don't know anything because you can say, mm. well, I 
something about Islam. So, uh, and I said, well, yeah, of course. And that's what I did. And I was in parliament till 2017. So altogether about, uh, uh, is it eight years almost? And, um, and I was also in politics in the provincial states. The Netherlands is, is cut in, in 12 pieces. <laughs> you have your okay. constituencies or districts, I think. Right? Yeah, yeah. Constituencies, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in the Netherlands, there are, you have 12, and I was a member of uh, one of those constituencies here uh, where I live, uh, also next to the job I had in Parliament, but I was also in the City Council. So I was in all three levels of politics in the Netherlands for 12 years altogether. What was uh, your subject at uni? Sorry, you said comparative religion, and what about PhD level? Uh, well, I'm still uh, working on the PhD. Okay, sorry. Yeah, he, yeah. okay. So that's uh, that's something I'm I'm doing right now. But um, it's and what's, the, uh, what's the subject? If you don't oh, mind, because I'm at uni as well, so I'm interested in. Oh, really? Nice. Well, yeah, I'm. Um, there's the subject about converts in the Netherlands, and uh, it, uh, way back there were a lot of uh, people leaving for Syria, for example. Uh-huh. What that what we saw is converts. That, mm. no, converts leaving for Syria. Yeah. A lot of people were leaving for Syria, yeah. uh, converts and non-converts. But uh, okay. when we look at statistics, and that's something, it's not really, um, uh, they, they didn't do anything with it when, you, when it comes to research yet. Uh, just, mm. just a little, uh, We see that one out of uh, uh, five converts that uh, uh, were converted in those periods, uh, some people say they left for Syria. So it's an extreme amount. And when you compare it to the normal uh, born and raised Muslim, that's extreme. So, yeah. so how is it possible? A high proportion, uh, yeah, relatively. Yeah. How, yeah. Yeah. how is it possible that those persons they, that convert uh, go all the way, so to say, and uh, go mm. to the extreme? So that's something that, uh, that, that, that's... Interesting. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. Um, but uh, to, to answer your question, uh, the, or the, to finalize the answer, yes. uh, I, I, I uh, became a m- member of parliament and in 2014... Uh, I left the party. I still was in Parliament uh, even three years after that. But uh, because uh, Wilders asked during a rally, do you want more or less Moroccans in the Netherlands? And everybody Say that started. again. Wilders asked what? Sorry. Do you want more or less Moroccans, Moroccan people in the Netherlands? And he asked that during oh. a political rally. And everybody starts shouting less, less, less. And okay. then he said, well, I make that happen. So... Uh, he said, well, I want to expel them, so to say. And uh, he said it a little bit different, but that was uh, that was the message. Uh, Has Netherlands I, got a special thing about oh, Moroccans? Like, are Moroccans the majority Im- immigrants or something? From uh, what, one, of, one of the biggest minority groups, yes. Why, why, why did he say Moroccans? I'm just interested to know why yeah. Moroccans. Well, because, uh, just... first, of course, they're Muslims. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's a thing, but when you look at the statistics, when it comes to criminal behavior, when it comes to, mm. uh, uh, for example, leaving school without a diploma or uh, unemployment, uh, like that. Mm. So, and they, he said, well, it has to do with the Moroccan people, but also with their Islamic background, because Islam is retarded, mm. and because they are Muslim, they are stealing, they're robbing, etc. Et so he said, it's because they are Muslim that they are do things like that. Right. But in the end. He, he he made so to say uh, a cut between Moroccan and Islam, and he was only talking about Moroccan people. And I find it a kind of strange because in the uh, party, the Freedom Party, there were Moroccan people as well. Of course, they were not Muslim, but they were mm. very secular. Uh, most of the time, ex-Muslims secular, yep. mm-hmm. or secular Muslims or, or Christian or Jews or whatever. But no, not Muslims, of course, not mm-hmm. practicing. But uh, I, I thought it was kind of a betrayal because you say, well, if you want to get rid of all Moroccan people, you're talking about your allies as well. Uh, well so how I did said, they feel? <laughs> how did they feel about that? The Moroccans? Yeah, in the they party. didn't like it, of course. They didn't like it. But they said, well, okay, perhaps he doesn't mean it like that. He just but, got a bit carried away. Yeah. But yeah. I, I talked to him about this uh, topic uh, quite extensively. <laughs> and he said, no, that's not what I say. This is literally what I say. I want less Moroccan people in the okay. Netherlands. So and then I said, well, I'm the spokesperson in Parliament, not you, on this topic. So first, it would be nice if you inform me <laughs> if you're planning <laughs> to you make a, 
something. Yeah. And I say, well, it's it's really uh, it's it's uh, you're, you're changing policies now because it's not about Islam anymore. Mm. It's not about this ethnicity of Moroccan people. And I said, that's not why, not why I'm in politics. I, I'm in politics because I don't like Islam. And I think we have to stop the Islamization of our society. So in the end, we got into a fight with words, of course. <laughs> and <laughs> I, uh, I left the party. But I was still not liking Islam. So that's in 2014, 2015. That was when I started writing my book. Because if right. you're a member of the Freedom Party, you're not allowed to write books on Islam. Because that's the main uh, topic for Geert Wilders himself. And he said, of course, you can uh, write with me like a co-writer, but not yourself, because I'm the spokesperson. I'm the, I'm the so to say, the symbol of anti-Islam. Yeah. You know, the so, voice of, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and then I told him, I said, well, I finally have the time to fulfill my long-held desire writing an anti-Islam book. Uh, right. And explaining why we are so anti-Islam. Because most right. of the time, politics there are only one-liners and stupid uh, debates and mm-hmm. it's not that you have the time to really explain how you feel why you feel uh, uh, take the sources explain etc and i thought well i want to writing a book nobody can talk to me i can just write it down and people will read it so that was uh, <laughs> how it started wow um i want to ask you there's so many other questions like okay so like you know, when you tell me that story and you, especially the 9-11 thing, 9-11, I had just had my first child, actually. I, mm-hmm. I was a young mom. We're the same age, so I was 21, right? 21, about 21. Um, and I remember hearing about it on the radio as I was uh, feeding him. And yeah, it was a shock to everybody. Um, but since then i'd written for the times like just some um just some like interesting articles to explain things about islam that they asked me to write you know like ramadan and things like that and i got a letter from an english lady i got a few letters one was like a five-page letter from a man who told me why i couldn't be so positive as a muslim in the uk you know you know i try to convey like a positive message but He was like, you know, these are all the things that are wrong with Islam. And it was like a five-page thing, you know? That's not much. Uh, <laughs> no. It's only five pages. <laughs> handwritten, handwritten as well. Mm. Um, also. But another lady, she sought me out and she she sent me a message. And she and it was like, she was an old lady, an eld, elder lady. Mm. And, uh, you know, she said, you know, someone like you who wears the face veil, you know i just feel sad i just feel sad because i feel like my country has changed beyond recognition and i feel like if i met you in the street you probably wouldn't even speak to me and uh and you know i feel like the the things that my uh four mothers fought for uh, in freedom for women um have are being changed by you and your co-religionists don't you think she said don't you think you know that you also have some uh, responsibility or something like this you know and she and she was really it was a really heartfelt letter yeah and initially i've you know obviously when you hear when somebody says that to you you think okay you know they've got a lot of prejudices and things like that but i actually thought to myself no i'm actually going to try to empathize with this woman you know um, and I don't think we do that enough, by the way, as Muslims. Like, um, and I thought, yeah, I mean, come on, you know, you've got all these like people who look different to you. They they have a different culture. Um, they eat different types of food to you as well. Like, you, the the nature of your high street has changed, and you know, your people. I mean, there, there's some things that have changed anyway about British society, like. People don't even know their neighbors anymore, but that's that's got nothing to do with Islam, right? But but I think on top of that, when you see this kind of very visible change, I thought to myself, you know, yeah, it's change is scary. Change is scary to anyone, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I re- I replied to her in a very empathetic way, you know, and I said, you know what, you're 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 right that Muslims need to do more to build bridges and reach out and not not live in ghettos and not kind of stay in their own communities that, because I do believe that more dawah and more you know and dawah when I say dawah I don't just mean preaching and 
you know, put, handing out leaflets. Yeah. yeah. I mean, knowing your neighbors, caring about your community, like Akhlaq. feeling feeling that Britain is yours, you know, your 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 country that you care about, you know. Um and I replied in an empathetic way and I, I pointed out to her that look, I know change is really hard, but uh, I said, look, the, some of some things that you said are a misconception, um, especially like about women. Don't don't you feel upset by the objectification of women in society? Uh, you know, if I met you, I would speak to you, and I, I don't veil in front of women. You know, we just veil in front of men. Um, so I would greet you, and I would welcome you to my house, and you know. Um, but I also said to her, look, you know, my my sister, she's married to an Englishman. And, you know, they have a child. And that's the future of Britain. You know, like Britain has changed. Uh, people are marrying into different cultures. And perhaps that's a beautiful thing. You know, that's something that and, and she, she responded and she said, wow, you know, you've really put my heart to rest. I was really surprised, actually. She said, you really touched me and really put my heart to rest. And I'm going to keep reading your letter again and again because um, it's really given me comfort. And I, I was quite surprised, actually. But it shows but wanted... the power of, 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 uh, of good behavior and of, of yeah. caring. Empathy. Empathy, and like, I think. And Adam, it's, it's just showing, it's, it's living sooner, I think. But, but, but uh, the reason why I mentioned the word empathy is when you were just describing now uh, you as a student, you know, with whatever your background and then hearing about 9-11, I didn't feel that your reaction was irrational, you know, the anti-Islam oh, reaction. No, no, I, I actually no. thought, hey, if I was him, I would probably have reacted the same way because, like, who are these people, you know, who, who are these people, the audacity of these people who are coming to attack our you know, countries or our symbols, you know, like the World Trade Center is basically a symbol, a symbol of, of yeah. Western civilization, right? Like how far have they reached, right? I I can actually empathize with that. And I know a lot of Muslims don't like that, you know, uh, they like to, to say, oh, they're just a bunch of racists or whatever. But I think you have to sometimes put rhetoric aside and actually think, wait a minute, if I was in that situation, if I was a young person and all I'd heard about Islam was this and then this thing happens, yeah, I would sign up to the nearest party too, you know, if I felt strong, strongly enough about my people, my civilization, my my religion. So, and, But this, the, hmm. the last thing you mentioned, I think that's something very important and it's not mentioned enough i sometimes even not at all uh, is yes. is religion because uh like you said to the women in your letter that britain changed and but britain changed in, in a certain way the same way dutch society changed or the swedish society or danish or whatever belgium france they all got secularized and that's right a Because when I talked to my grandfather, when he was still alive, he ended up uh, as a 94-year-old uh, man. And just before he passed away, I told him I became a Muslim. And he was literally on his deathbed. So wow. it was kind of hard to do because he was a minister. And then, of course, when one of your uh, grandchildren tells you, well, I, uh, I leave the truth, so to say. Yes, that, yes. Uh, that, that's harsh but uh well he and that, that's uh, that's another story but he, he told me well um at least you didn't become catholic <laughs> really wow yeah. i thought well that's that's it's deep <laughs> the anti uh catholic feelings are deep <laughs> but uh he said no that's uh, the reason I, he said it was i said well because sunni islam is much more related to protestant christianity than you think uh really and, Uh, yeah, so it was very special. But um, he told me when the when Muslims would have come to Europe, for example, in the 1920s, there wouldn't have been so much problems because a lot of problems nowadays had to do with moral issues because mm. uh, veiling, of course, is, is a moral statement, so to say. That's why right. the, the nuns are veiled as well. And that's why people exactly. in the church... It's not hell. a political statement. It's, no, a, it's an act of worship, a moral 
Yeah, and it's the same it's when it comes, for example, uh, using drugs, alcohol, prostitution, abortion, uh, dressing like you're a whore, stuff like that. And when when people see it from a religious perspective, they understand it. When I say, well, would, what would you say if you were a practicing Christian? I'd rather uh, 10 times, even when I was a member of, of, the, of the Freedom Party, I 10 times... Uh, uh, more, uh, I want to have a, a Muslim practicing Muslim next to me when it comes to the moral issues than a hard right. secularist g- uh, guy or girl who was living a life that I don't want to uh, have my children uh, in their life. So when they are, for example, walking around naked in their garden and say, well, it's just my freedom and they're using drugs and drinking alcohol and swearing and doing all those things. And I'm not saying that all non uh, believers yeah. do that, but it's uh, to, yes. to explain in a, in a, yeah. uh, well, it's, it's being, a, it's being promoted in society, yeah. right? Through culture. Yeah. And, mm. yeah. And so, um, I think that's a big problem because, uh, normally when, when society is in, uh, let's say the 1920s, it was a Christian society. So when people right. say, I don't want my wife to do this or my man do that, or I don't want to have billboards saying, uh, commit adultery, commit adultery, just yeah. call or uh, visit this website or stuff like that. Everybody would understand because yes. the, you were talking about empathy for, but also understanding of religion. That's yes. God. And I think that's a big problem because a lot of children nowadays are so much secularized that they don't, they're almost unable to, f- em- uh, to feel empathy for religious, uh, religious feelings because they really do not understand it. They really don't understand so that's a big problem. And I everything see has been deconstructed. Everything has been deconstructed yeah. to such an extent and relativized, right? Yeah. And, and people so, feel mm. uh, lost because the, the woman, and I have this conversation, I had it many, many times when I was in politics, but also when I left politics, uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, natives, so to say, uh, they said, well, uh, we lost our story with a capital S. And say, yeah, but it's your own fault. That's not the fault of the Muslims. <laughs> because yeah, Islam, you mean you mean the Christian yeah. story, right? The Christian yeah, yeah, story. That, because yeah. Christianity did everything. When you exactly. look at uh, the whole way of, especially the Netherlands, how our country is formalized. And when you look at institutions, it all has to do with Christianity. The political parties even have Christian names. People have Christian names. When you walk through the landscape, you see churches, uh, the, the way we are taught, our language, we have certain verbs. It, it, it talks about Christianity, of everything. Is good. And But people really don't understand it because they lost their own narrative, so to say. And, yeah. uh, Christianity and now, has basically been demonized. It's been ridiculed. Yeah. So much like growing up, we used to feel offended by the stuff that was said about Isa, Jesus, Jesus, right? Yeah, um, yeah, and that's logical. But but nowadays, um, people don't see that anymore, right? And they almost brought up hostile to religion in in general because first it was Christianity, but I see it happening in the Netherlands. It's now becoming Islam because Islam is the only stronghold, so to say, in a religious sense. Yes. That's, anchor that's, if you it's, it's anchored right and people yeah, when there's a void when you leave a void of religion yeah. it needs to be filled with something and it's yeah. almost like it's almost like the market the free market you know like if you yeah. if, if if something is not available on the market someone comes in and fulfills yeah. that need right yeah and islam has done that basically and i think it's very uh and i don't want to say that's the, the hand of god but it's it's yeah. it's um remarkable that at the same time that Europe is secularizing, all those yeah. people with an Islamic background come in. So it's almost like, okay, you're, you're not allowed to lose your religion, so to say. And, yeah. uh, and I think... And, and a- I wish, I wish, and, and this, is, this, this takes me to the next question, I wish that somehow we could shift the narrative so that instead of seeing that as a curse... Europe began to see that as a blessing. You know? yeah, and I, I think there is a tiny shift happening right now, right? With, yeah. with, with you know, Jordan Peterson and the stuff that he's saying yeah. about nihilism and uh, how, you know, the death of God, so-called death of God has caused basically all of this, like the, 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 the very bedrock and anchor of Western civilization to be ripped out. I think he's awakened people to that fact, like to the point that 
I don't know if you know um, Douglas Murray, right? Douglas Murray yeah. in the UK. Um, he, I actually met him once on a TV oh, show. Uh, but he, I, I've seen the shift even in him, right? Like initially he was so anti-religion, even anti any religion, right? He's, yeah. It seemed like he was an atheist and he was like, disparaging of all and it was kind of fashionable isn't it like to be like a new atheist type right yeah. or to support them Actually in the intellectual scene but since he's met jordan peterson and had some of those uh public discussions with uh, sam harris and yeah. i've noticed that even he has started to say that actually we can't of we can't <laughs> afford to leave a void you know like the void that we're leaving is going to be filled and yep. obviously for them, it's like the radical left that are filling that void, but also Islam, right? Yep. And and I was thinking, wow, you know, like the West is slowly waking up to that fact, you know, that like, for example, uh, somebody, somebody uh, like Douglas who complains about how, you know, Islam is basically, you know, he, he's written that book, um, The Strange Death of Europe, right? Um, somebody like that who complains about Islam in that way you'd think he should be going to church. You know, he should be like, you know, getting everybody to, hey, let's revive, you know, our our history. Let's revive our civilization and its bedrock. But yeah. but no, they won't do that. They don't go to that extent. No, so, and I think, I think that that is impossible because I think Christianity, it has been researched so much. And ridiculed, yes. It's researched so much, not ridiculed, of course. Okay. Ridiculed okay. Well, yeah. But yeah. researched so much that when you really um, look into the religion, you see the truth of Islam in Christianity. So I th really think there won't be a revival of Christianity in Europe. I think Christianity is dead. But I do think that a lot of conservatives will enter Islam in the end. And it will perhaps it will take decades, but that's something that will happen, and I think that's a very good thing because that's well, Islam isn't uh, is of course part of Europe as well. Because when you look at the history of Spain, you have eight hundred years of Islam in Spain. When you look at, for example, Bosnia or Albania, those are parts of Europe as well, of course. And yes. there's been a long ex uh, um, exchange of ideas, exchange of culture, etc. between. Christian Europe and the Muslim world. But I th really think uh, when you look at the, the, the theo theological concept of the first revelation for the Jews, then for the Christians, the Bible and the New Testament, uh, Injil, yeah. and then of course you've got Quran as the final message. I think that's something, it's like a stage of Europe as well, because of course Definitely. everybody, yeah, and, and I think, and I hope. And it makes sense. It's like, it's like. Uh, it's a the, huge, a long, divine story that makes sense, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, mm. absolutely, absolutely. So I, uh, I, I really hope uh, for uh, for this to happen, of course, but it will take a long time, I think. Okay, how do we break the deadlock? Is there anything we could be doing, like that? When you when you look at Muslim uh, societies and Muslim, I don't know, the Dao scene, or because you're in the Dao scene now, right? Um, how can we break the deadlock between particularly the political right and Islam? Yeah, well, I think it, uh, the political right has to look at itself as well, because it's kind of funny that, uh, for example, um, uh, Geert Wilders, he, is, he always talks about defending the Judeo-Christian culture. I don't know if that's something you hear in, in Britain as well. Uh, but, uh, People don't but, usually say judo Christian. Uh, yeah, perhaps the Christian uh, heritage or whatever. That's something even, they even Christian. It's it's very un. I don't know if you know, like uh, when uh, Tony Blair when he tried to bring God into things. You know, his famously his uh, his spin doctor said to him, "We don't do God." <laughs> he actually said to him, "Don't mention God." Like, so in Britain, you don't oh. talk about God. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Well, that's a little yeah. bit different here. Um, okay. They talk about the Judeo-Christian heritage, and we have to defend mm. it. But the, the two main parties that promote that, the leaders of those parties, aren't Christian. <laughs> They're not religion at all. So they that's don't kind go of, to church. They, they don't go. No, really. They one of them really said, "I don't believe in God." So it's kind of strange. <laughs> that the two political parties who are talking about Christianity and defending the Christian heritage don't believe in God at all. And then there's another party who's talking about. Uh, we have to stop immigrants because of 
uh, they're they're taking over, they're making too much babies, etc. Mm -hmm. But those persons, the complete top, I was just something I was looking in last uh, last weekend. They all are not married, and they don't have children. <laughs> It's kind of strange. I think so, so. so basically, there's this cognitive dissonance, right? Like, really, yeah. uh, they, they <laughs> we, we want this, but we're not willing to act it out in our own lives. Yeah. So, so don't they feel? Don't they? Don't they ever think about that? Isn't that ever pointed out to them? No, never. So, if I was still in politics, I would ask them. <laughs> well, okay, kind so. of, it's, it's it's like you're not practicing uh, what you preach. What you preach? Yeah. Hypocrisy, uh, basically. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. very strange. That, that's what I mean. That's exactly what I see in someone like Douglas Murray as well. You know, yeah, like the things, the yeah. very things that he says. You know, Muslims they're having, basically they're having so many kids. They're, yeah. Um, they they they're so devoted and they're whatever whatever. Okay, yeah. why don't you counter that by, you know, having kids and yeah, going to church and <laughs> being promoted and go and you know. I encourage more society yeah. <laughs> to adopt those things, right? But they they won't encourage the society to adopt Christianity, even. And really, it's just. So, so what are they offering? What do they see themselves as offering? Well, in the end, nothing, because uh, people uh, say, "Well, it's an extreme right party." They always talk about the left and the right. I don't know if yeah. that's in, in, yes, in, same in, here. Yeah, yeah. The Tories and the in the the Labour Party, of course, in the yeah. UK. Yeah. Uh, well, in the Netherlands, it's the same, but a little bit different. But uh, in, in, when you look at in essence, it's the same. But the political right used to be the Christian side, the religious side of politics. And on the left side, there were the atheists, the socialists, the communists. And the, but that changed. In the Netherlands, you see that the, as well, the left as well as the right are almost a-religious. There's only there were two parties still here who are religious, two small Christian parties, and that's it. So all those parties mm -hmm. are so extreme liberal, so secularized that there is no difference anymore between them, the left and the right. The only thing they're talking about now are exactly. uh, the, the, the smaller things in life, so to say. Yeah. And, it's the and same now, here. Like there's not that much difference, to be honest. Between no, the, and of course they won't the right. admit it. And they say, well, we are, we are fighting for the, the working class, blah, blah, blah. Of course you do. But that's not the real story. That's not, that, that's not a narrative you want to sell to your voters on the long term. And they mm. both have no story. And I think that's a problem. And I think that is a, an opportunity as well for Muslims because you ask, what can we do? I think, first of all, we have to do dawah. But like you said in the beginning, not just uh, handing out uh, brochures, for example, but really offering uh, a solution in in daily life so do you think that works on a one-to-one -one level is that where it starts like yeah absolutely yeah and absolutely. and i yeah, have that's, just that's trying to think because because like you said so many times i've come across people on the right and thought well we've actually got the same we socially anyway like we've morally we've got very a lot in common and yeah if only you could see that um, yeah. But they will, but it takes time because, like you said, it, it, it changed overnight for them, the society. But so, do you um, think people like you should be leading that? That 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 that's I guess. Like uh, I, I want I want to know, like honestly, like when you see uh, Muslims like Hamza Yusuf, and when you did meet uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, so they're obviously white Western. Uh, converts, right? No. Does that have an impact on you? A different type of impact, uh, you know, than I don't know, someone else who might be doc doctor, someone, or you know, whatever, professor, something else, but but not of your own in in ethnicity and background. It must have a different well, impact. Well, not so much for me, I think, but uh, it is when you have discussions with people who are very anti-Islam, they see Islam as something exotic, foreign, foreign, something something not from here, not localized, so to say. Right. And when they then when they see a white person, whether it's a girl or a boy, it changes because in a way you're one of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in a way of like, course, I, I don't think we should be embarrassed to say that because that's normal. Yes, like that's how even it works. in the Quran it says that you know <clears throat> every nation 
God sent a messenger from within them, right? Like there's something yeah. very powerful in that, right? And and it, I think it's normal because it's a sociological truth that you yeah. are uh, the people who look like you are the first people you go to because that feels safe. So that's not not, not nothing strange. Chinese people have that. Dutch people, uh, people from yeah. UK, Pakistan, Peru, whatever. So that's normal. Mm. So when it comes to uh, bridging the gap, so to say, uh, I think yes. it's very important that uh, you don't not only see people who don't look like you, but also people who do look like you. I think that the 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 the, the, the strength of Islam is the universal message, and not to be uh, all leftish. Uh, it's not a leftish story, but I, I mean that uh, everybody faces the same problems in their personal life. And everybody, in the end, as a religious person, is you need God as as the the end solution. So uh, Islam is the only religion that invites everybody, really right. everybody, and it explicitly says there is not a better black person than a white person. There's not a better white person than a black person. The only thing, uh, of course, the famous hadith is that uh, the the piety and the way you act yes. that's you a better person. Mm. And when you look at Christianity, for example, of course, in the New Testament there are texts that talk about equality and uh, women and Greeks and, and Jews, etc. But it's not so explicitly and it, it's not something that's in daily life in the, the current context that hits so hard because it's not about Greek persons or, uh, or Macedonian people. <laughs> people talk about black and white. They say, okay, you are white, you are black. And that's something you see in Islam. It's very explicit and it's for all time. So I think the message there is so strong so strong that even uh, the other way around you, for example, you look at um, someone like Malcolm X, who was yeah. very anti-white, very anti-American. Um, and of course, that's logical when you look at his context, his past, etc. But he also had an experience during his Hajj that he saw a white person with blue eyes handing him a cup of water and he, they drank from the same. And then he said, well, mm-hmm. I, I was messed up. I was messed right. up. Islam cured me in a way. And I think that is something that a lot of um, white Europeans uh, have to go through as well. But then the other way around, that they see, well, it's not that we have the same core values, um, We, but, but I have to see through the appearance of the other. Do you think eventually the frustrations of, of you know, Europeans with the radical left, right, and the complete deconstruction that's going on, right, Mm -hmm. to the point where, for example, right now you see, like, men or people who who were born men uh, who are saying that they're women and competing with women in sports, right, like, and and stuff like that, right, like, that, that must make people go mad, you know, like, just seeing that, like, seeing men beat up women, biological yeah. men beating up women and that being okay like you know it's gone to that extent now right do you think yeah. the radical left and its excesses is going to eventually drive uh western people or europeans to say wait a minute i'm done with this like i'm done with this entire craziness you know and i need something more anchored do you think that could possibly lead people to islam I think it will play a part. Uh, it will play a part, yeah, I think. But, I, but there's something else, because you asked, what can the Muslims do? I think that what something very important that Muslims can do as, as a community is don't vote for left parties and don't become active okay. in, in, in uh, very progressive organizations because you send out mixed, mixed signals. Because on the one hand, you say, for example... I'm very conservative when it comes to family, but on the other way, you're promoting, for example, uh, women uh, sporting, uh, competing against um, transgender men. So that's kind of okay, but that's, that's really difficult, isn't it? Like uh, that's difficult for people because they're like, it's like what happened in UK. You know, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. He's just such a he's just such a friend of Muslims. Do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. just as a person and yeah. his whole support of the Palestinian cause, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, of course. Like, but- and then you have on the other hand, a party that's like the conservative party where I know that certain moral values align, but actually the leader of the party makes fun of 
us. And, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's it, and there's Islamophobia that doesn't even get talked about. And so, it's like, the same here. It's the same here. Confusing. Year. It's confusing yeah. for Muslims. Like, okay, uh, so yeah, what's no, if no. you're saying don't join the left? Then what? Are you saying well, join the right? No, because I think you have to join yourself. And I think that's the point because uh, we have elections in uh, three weeks here mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, city councils. Uh, and someone asked me, what are you voting for? I'm so curious. Yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm curious myself <laughs> because uh, I, it's like you're a political orphan. <laughs> because, yes. of course, when I look at the moral agenda of the left, the progressive left, I cannot vote for a, a progressive organization because I don't want my children to brought up in a world that they promote. Yeah. On the other hand, when I look at the, 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 the conservative parties in the Netherlands, the right political parties, they are so anti-Islam that I cannot vote for them because they... <laughs> yeah, because it, you're creating a, hostile, I, a more yeah, hostile environment. Of course, yeah. So I'm, I'm yeah. a political orphan. So what, what should happen is that I think that Muslims start organizing themselves and found institutions and not that they say, well, you cannot vote for us or you don't belong to us because we are Muslims. No, you have to start, so to say, a new conservative organization and not only in politics, yeah. but also media and stuff like that, schools where everybody's welcome, but we are organized out of this Islamic fundament, this, this concept. This is who we are. We are Muslims and we promote Islamic values. We promote the Islamic way of life. And of course, we, we don't want to impose it to you, but you are welcome to follow us as well or join us or whatever, so that you are an open conservative party with an Islamic background because you have to localize. Uh, and and you, I said, think, you said institution. Yeah. Do you mean political party? Or, For example, or political parties, political parties, but also media organizations, newspapers, um, uh, internet websites, schools, uh, stuff like that. That is happening, though, isn't it? Slowly but surely, it is happening. Yeah, well, in, yeah, and I think that that's that will be the answer. In the end, so it's going to be. So, so do you see it as being slow, organic? Yeah, yeah, inevitable. That's, yeah, that, <laughs> inevitable. That's, and, yeah, and a lot of people, of course, want to. Uh, a one-day solution. So, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. And next week, it's all fixed. Yeah, that's not how it works, unfortunately. But I think in the end, about in about 40, 50 years, the landscape will totally be different if Muslims will be able to organize and be open uh, to society as well. Because like you said in the beginning, I think, and that's something uh, because there are a lot of things society uh, does wrong, but there are a lot of things that the Muslim community can do better as well. And that's one of them is that you adapt the, 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 the country you live in and see it as your own because you are born here, your children will die here probably. Yeah. So it is your ground as well. And I think when you look at it from a Dawa perspective, the whole world is our masjid. It was all created by, by Allah. So you have, to, you have to share the message here as well. It, perhaps it's even more important here because a lot of people don't know about Islam, although there are a lot of Muslims here. So that's something that's kind of strange. So that's that's the message I always try to share with uh, the fellow brothers and sisters. I, I, I've got just two more things, please, if you don't mind. I really want to ask you. One is, dawah to the elite in society. So uh, this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time, and I just wanted your thoughts on it. So, you know, like, because I was involved in a Dawah organization, IERA, um, you might have heard of it, Abdurrahim Green, Hamza Zorzis, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, most of the Dawah effort, I would say, is grassroots, you know, very yeah. much grassroots. Uh, and at some point, I started thinking to myself, you know, I wish that there was more effort also on the other side of society, which is, you know, the upper classes, the 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 the, po the political leaders, the in Britain, you know, we have like obviously we have like uh, you know lords and ladies, and uh, we have barons and earls, right? Yeah. Um, and also really like highly influential people, so sports personalities, and so the the, the new rich as well, right? Mm. And I was thinking to myself, Subhanallah, like th there's this saying. Um, you know, actually, let me let me just quickly bring it. Uh, I, I posted it on Twitter recently. Uh, basically, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, one of the companions, he said about Omar bin al-Khattab, you know, the, uh, the second caliph. He said, Omar's embracing Islam was our victory. 
His migration to Medina was our success and his reign a blessing from Allah. We didn't offer prayers in the Masjid al-Haram, meaning, you know, in front of the Kaaba, mm -hmm. until Umar had accepted Islam. When he accepted Islam, the Quraysh, so in other words, the ruling class, mm -hmm. were compelled to let us pray in the mosque, in, in, in front of the Kaaba, right? Yeah. And subhanAllah, like just thinking about that and then thinking about how the Prophet Sallallahu also, he actually devoted, although of course he cared about everyone, he did devote some special attention, sometimes even special uh, resources to da'wah, to the upper echelons of society, right? I don't know what to call them, the elite, the, in, the establishment, the influentials, right? And in a way, you, you are from the establishment, whether you, you like it or not, like you were, right? So I would really like to hear from you, like what you think about that, because I feel like if we could... First of all, I don't know how we would do this, but, and I'd like to hear from you on that. Um, if we were to also exert effort or some kind of, you know, um, have some kind of even strategy to, to talk to and influence the upper echelons and the establishment, I feel like that would have a quicker impact, you know, than what's happening now which is <clears throat> which is the masses the which is you know grassroots dawa only mainly i would say and so in a way that's that's organic maybe it's maybe it's going to end up being better because you know at the end of the day the elite you know they have to they have to listen to the their people right but it makes me ask you know like what efforts are being done to influence the establishment, what can we do? What do you think about about my theory or what I've just said? Well, I think it's very interesting, <laughs> and I think it's uh, it's true. Uh, if you want to uh, speed it up, <laughs> uh, yeah. then then I yeah, of course you have to be uh, at the places where uh, uh, laws are being made, where um, uh, the message, the, the cultural message, is being ventilated. And like I said, if you start working on organizations, you can aim inside such an organization for a specific group. So, uh, for example, if, if there were people in the UK, Muslims, who would organize and start their own political party, they would be and they would be elected and they are inside parliament uh, and they were able to talk to the people there. They see how they live. They see how they do, they, how they act, what they what they bring. Uh, that's something that could be very strong. It's the same with, with, with media organizations. If you uh, are um, just uh, aiming for the masses and you're just um, making, for example, cartoons in a very simple uh, way, of course, it's, it's, it can be effective for youngsters or for uh, people uh, outside the elite. But some people who want to be um, filled more with uh, certain theological information or information about uh, the, the, the bigger uh, the bigger story of Islam, I think you have to aim for them as well, specifically. And I think you can do that by organizing yourself, by starting um, organizations, institutions. What we do in the Netherlands, I founded an organization, I don't know if you ever heard of it, it's called uh, Islam Experience Center. Yeah, yeah, I heard of it. Tell, tell us about it. Yeah, and what we do is that we uh, go to schools and uh, where we show uh, people, especially non-Muslims, uh, the story of Islam through mm -hmm. virtual reality. So we yeah. we have all those virtual reality glasses. We bring them. We go to schools. We say, okay, let's. And then we have a, a whole class. So what we do, we start first. We have an association round, and we ask, okay, what do you think when you hear the word Islam? It doesn't matter. You can say everything. You can say terrorism or blood or whatever. Or you can say uh, uh, the prophet, uh, peace and blessings be upon him, or or the mosque. There's there's no good or false. So and then we write it down on the board, or we uh, let them write it on notes so they can be anonymous. They we throw it in a bowl, and then I say, well, okay, I explain. I explain how uh, the VR works. Then we look at the VR video. It's about ten minutes. And after the VR video, and it shows you the basic stuff of Islam, uh, 
the Quran, Islam, um, uh, history, inventions, like a uh, thousand and one invention style. Uh, and it's it's all in VR. So it's, it's like they experience it for real and by themselves. And after that, we uh, talk about the video, but also about what they said when they were asked about what their association was with Islam. And then we say, the how, beginning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how is it possible that those things are so different? Different. That, yeah. And then, um, then they start questioning and talking. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a good way, especially because we also sometimes go to gymnasiums. I don't know if you have that in, in uh, the UK as well. That's the highest level. So to say Ivy League schools. I don't, in the United States, you have Ivy League schools. That's, uh, that's a very, uh, so, so to say, elite schools. Oh, like the private. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not private in Lens, but it's the highest level of education you can have in high school before you enter university. And that's what we do. And we go specific sometimes to schools like that. And we have a, a, a program for those children as well. And that's different from the, the normal program. And you see, because we have feedback from them as well, they say, well, that's, that's the first time somebody tells me about religion in a way that it doesn't sound stupid. And those children are the future of, of tomorrow, of course. Those are the elites of tomorrow. So when you start uh, going to them at, in a young, at a young age and you start giving them information and tools and, and the truth and why it's not ridiculous to be a religious person, especially not when it comes to Islam, then you give them something that perhaps in, in, when they grow up or get older, they don't have this anti-Islam. Negative association. But, yeah, but also, perhaps they will be a Muslim. We have two guys now. Uh, one is 21 and one is what older. He told us, yeah, I became Muslim uh, mainly because you started with it. And it is two years ago. And that was two of those persons are from those, so to say, Ivy League schools. So perhaps you don't Sorry, know. Sorry, what, 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 what did they say caused them to, to become They said, Muslim? well, the Islam Experience Center uh, visit, and it was just one visit. Wow. That mm -hmm. was such an impact on us and the way how we see Islam. And what you gave us answers, and that's not me as a person, but the organization and the people who work with us. So they gave us such normal answers and they explained Islam and religion in such a rational way, because I think yes. that's very important for the Western mind. It's very rational. Not so yep. emotional. Uh, and they said, well, that's the first time I, I could relate to it. I said, well, perhaps that is the truth. So, and in, there are two, two of them ended up being Muslim. <laughs> I'm doing wow, that. Yeah. So, uh, and I think th those those are youngsters. So they are the future. So you don't know where they end up. Yes, yes, absolutely. Wow, yes. Um, you know, it, it makes me think, because it, it, my experience was like that as well at school. Like, uh, as a Muslim, my dad is an Islamic scholar as well. So I mm. grew up religious, you know, like that wasn't normal in that time. Um, but my the Christians in my class, the religious Christians, they were always my good friends you know they always saw me as like wow she's you know she's she's wears her hijab with pride and we get made fun of just for being christians you know mm. um without even looking different right um and other friends of mine later on when we left school now now you know however old we are um they've reached out to me and they'll say you know what you you really impact uh, impacted us just because of simple things you know like having certain principles, not backbiting, for example, you know, like really simple things that that I just did because that was my upbringing and, you know, like, and, and, but also sometimes they would ask me questions, you know, like, what does Islam say about this? What does Islam say about that? And and the answers for them were refreshing, you know. Yeah. So I, think, I, I can definitely see the impact of that. Yeah, and I think that that, that can be another way of, uh, speeding up the process. And, uh, but, but, but also, Yoram, one thing I wanted to say is, that, you know, when I lived in Egypt, I, I was a student in Egypt. I think that was the first, I was 16. Uh, that was the first time I realized how much I love Britain, you know, and how, how British I am, actually. Um, because there were certain values that I saw had been, had, had just disappeared from what is ostensibly a Muslim society yeah. that I felt that I had a gut feeling for simply because I was British. And I'll give you an example of that. So I remember we were in exams and 
this is supposed to be like a religious school. And of course, like not all Muslims are like this, you know, with all the normal caveats. Mm. Uh, but this is a Muslim country. It's Al Azhar, right? Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to a to to a religious class. I want to be a scholar of Islam. I want to go back to Britain. You know, like knowledgeable, etc. And we're in exams, and uh, a teacher comes in and tells all the students the answers to the questions. Okay. Oh yeah. Really? He he helps them cheat basically, and I am sitting there, you know, like completely enraged because I've I've literally last year just sat my GCSEs in Britain, okay, where we had such an amazing sense of you know fairness. You know, we we would walk in, nobody nobody looks anywhere else. You you're not allowed to talk. You're not allowed to you know. There's no there's no question of cheating. You know. And and I remember sitting and thinking, where did I get that sense of, like, no one here actually thinks there's anything wrong with what's going on, right? And I've just revised, and I, you know, I'm, I'm I was a really good student. I w- was like a straight A student. So somebody like that, when you're somebody who studies a lot, it really affects you, you know, when you see people cheating. And and I was thinking, you know what? It's actually Britain and being British that gave me that sense of that very heightened sense of you know fair play it is a very british thing I, i'm not saying that islam didn't teach me that but the, the british culture is what i'm trying to say really instilled that in me and i feel like it made me really appreciate a lot of things about britain like uh even like the politeness that we learn that even just me as a as a muslim a british muslim you know, there's a certain level of politeness that you learn. There's a certain level of, I mean, there's so so many good things um, yeah, in course. our society. So I I don't want people to think that what we're talking about is like, oh, the West is so bad and it's no, not at all. In and, no, not at all. I, in fact, I, I see us. I see myself as a Westerner, right? Yeah. And I I feel like sometimes you have to see the opposite or the the opposite of your culture to realize the value of that British culture that, that is instilled in you, you know? Yeah, and like I said at the beginning, it has, I think it's something we have to do because if yeah. you want Islam to be spread all over the world, you have to be a Western Muslim because just like someone who lives in Indonesia has his Islam in his Indonesian context, just like someone in Turkey has or in Morocco or in England. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and, we, we should we should write a book together. I think uh, we should write a book. I think uh, build bridging the gap. That would be a good one. Bridging perhaps, the gap. But yeah. Would you Why be open to that? Seriously? Yeah, no, really. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not joking either. <laughs> you know, um, I've got some publishers here actually who are interested in me writing books. So okay. I, I really think that message uh, is a very powerful one. Bridging the gap, like what what basically the message i think to muslims but also to to westerners yeah. uh, i think it would be very powerful coming from somebody who was from an immigrant background like my parents from another country and somebody who's a a native european i think that would be nice and i yeah. think I, I think we've got a lot of ideas in common you know yeah seriously <laughs> so thank you so much jazakallah you you've really uh it's been very interesting. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation as well. And Absolutely. And uh, is, do you have any kind of parting message that you'd like to share? <laughs> well, what I, what I, a lot of people ask me what, when, I, uh, when I go to schools, uh, well, what do you want to say to the class? Sometimes the, the, the teacher asks us. And when I'm with uh, Muslims, and I think we have a Muslim audience, yeah. Uh, perhaps some non-Muslim who is lost uh, is listening, but I think yeah. most of the people are Muslim. Uh, but what, what I always try to uh, give them uh, when they, when they uh, leave class is it's that uh, they have to be aware of the fact that a lot of non-Muslims don't read the Quran and they don't read the Hadith. They read you and me. That's the only thing they see about Islam as a person. Yes, yes That's yes. the only thing they see. And if that's a mm. bad thing, 
they will think, whoa, if that's Islam, I don't want to be part of that. And if that's a, a beautiful thing and they see something that they say, whoa, that's inspiring, they get interested and they want to know more. So you are, and it's not always a fair thing and it's very heavy on the shoulders of, of the believers, you, me, and all the other persons. You are, so to say, a card, a card, a business card for, for Islam. Yes. So Absolutely. I think it's yeah. very important to be aware of. So you can you can do your dawah in your akhlaq and your adab. And uh, a lot of people forget that. Oh, Jazakallah khairan, uh, Brother Yoram. Uh, I really appreciate that. And thank you for your time. I'll let you go back to your family now. Uh, great honor. Uh, and, and, and let's talk about the book yeah we will we will and uh yeah in, in the future i'd love to talk to you about like what you think about like um you know what your plans are actually for the next 10 years what you seek are you going to be building that institution that you're talking about <laughs> who knows <laughs> yeah who knows okay i think that's a good place to finish uh salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Okay, dear brothers and sisters, you heard that amazing discussion with uh, Brother Yoram. Uh, I think I, I got a book deal out of it as well, a book a collaboration. Um, SubhanAllah, lots to think about. Please share the Ummah Talk podcast with others. Uh, we're on Muslim Central. Uh, via all the podcast platforms so Spotify uh, iTunes I think Google has its own podcast platform we're everywhere you know this is available everywhere via Muslim Central Fatima Barakatullah so do share it with others if you know somebody involved in da'wah da'wah organizations etc share it with them as well because I'd love for them to to hear you know this message please like the uh, episode leave us a star rating because the star ratings actually help uh you know spread the message and uh, uh help us to reach more people jazakum allah khairan wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk